This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. We've covered a lot of countries here on the program, but I can say with some certainty that this one, Equatorial Guinea, is the strangest country we have ever covered. It's a nation that by the end of reading a research packet, I had nearly 70 tabs open on my computer because every question just led to more questions. Every time I turn over a rock, I'd find a new rabbit hole. As just a taste, Equatorial Guinea is a Spanish-speaking colony in Africa that once had a GDP per capita higher than Spain, Poland, and most of Italy, but at the same time had nearly 70% of its country living on less than $1 a day. The first country's president claimed to have magic powers and praised Adolf Hitler as the savior of Africans in Africa. And that's just a taste. On top of that, the upcoming president being an Instagram star constantly flexing his wealth online, firing squads dressing up in Santa suits to carry out duties on Christmas Eve, the dictator's child being raised in North Korea by Kim Il-sung himself, and even on top of that, the country almost falling to a coup run by African mercenaries and funded by Margaret Thatcher's son. And it didn't even stop there. As even looking into the more mundane aspects of the country, we quickly discovered that the country is accelerating full speed right off the edge of an economic cliff, where the one industry that brings in 90% of the country's wealth just announced that they're about to pull the plug on their operations in Equatorial Guinea. Which as crazy as all the other stuff is, the cherry on top of all of that is the fact that Equatorial Guinea isn't even on the equator. Nothing about this country is as it seems or even straightforward. So stick with us for the next hour and experience the same bouts of whiplash, confusion, and dread that I've been experiencing for the last few weeks putting this piece together. So let's start poking around these rabbit holes and turn to our first guest. Part one, rich dad, poor country. Equatorial Guinea is often described as the forgotten colony. It was the last Spanish colony. So after gaining independence from Spain in the 60s, Equatorial Guinea faced political instability and repression under the rule of Francisco Macias Nguema. Uh, despite the country being rich in oil resources, it grapples with major economic mismanagement. There's high levels of unemployment, inadequate public services. There's also a lack of transparency and accountability in the resource management from the government, which really exacerbates all of these problems further. Education there and healthcare systems really suffer from underinvestment, which really hinders the human capital of this country. And it's also struggling majorly with inadequate infrastructure, particularly in the mainland, it makes many people from the outside ask, where is all the money going for Many Westerners and international media outlets describe it as the North Korea of Africa. Perry Grace is a geopolitical analyst and government advisor, specializing in the political and economic developments within energy export-driven states. She's written for multiple publications and has become one of the industry's most prominent voices on the intricacies of the implementation of disinformation within authoritarian states. And on top of all that, she's also one of the senior writers here at The Red Line, so we're thrilled to have her back on the program today. So, so Francisco is an extremely, extremely controversial figure. He was the first president of the country. His presidency was marked by authoritarian rule, political repression, widespread human rights abuses. Essentially, he began his career as a court clerk, and then he had this kind of series of rapid promotions and ended up becoming the deputy president of the governing council. How he came to presidency was really due to this emergence of Equatorial Guinea as an independent state. So once Spain in the late 60s began to be hit with pressure to grant the country independence. It really facilitated his win and he went on to win this supervised elections and he assumed the presidency and established a one-party state. Francisco Nguema, the country's first president, is a man we could do probably an entire episode on just by himself, as he is one of the oddest characters in modern history. Even his rise to power is as odd as the rest of him, as he originally made a name for himself as a court clerk and interpreter, mostly making a name for himself by being willing to take bribes from certain people to mistranslate testimonies in court cases in order to throw the case one way or the other. This extra money and political connections would eventually push him into politics, where his political beliefs continued to raise eyebrows, even going on to openly praise characters like Adolf Hitler, claiming openly in speeches that Adolf Hitler's main goal had been to save the Africans from colonialism but that he somehow got confused and attacked Europeans instead, somehow missing the entire German campaign in North Africa, I guess. 
and he would take these sort of opinions into the 1968 election, promising locals everything under the sun, and would go on to win that 1968 election. Once in power, would turn the country down a very dark path. Sadly, something all too common during this period of African history, as this was in the middle of the Cold War. As the continent begins to divide up, where did Equatorial Guinea and Gamer sit at the time? So during his time, he established close ties with countries aligned with the communist bloc. This was a time where the Soviet Union in particular was seeking to extend its influence and gain a more strategic advantage in Africa. And Gamer's uh, socialist policies and anti-imperialistic rhetoric really aligned with the Soviet agenda. At one point in time, for a good four years or four or five years, the USSR was the sole supplier of arms to the country. It received significant assistance from the Soviet Union, other communist countries, so aid programs, technical assistance, military cooperation in particular, they were all extended to his regime. So it essentially solidified his regime's control and gained influence in the country thanks to the Soviets. And Gamer's regime has always been categorized as one of absolute terror throughout the country. So can you take us through what actually happened and why it does have that reputation? Francisco really instilled a climate of fear through brutal repression, targeting his political opponents, intellectuals, any perceived threat to the regime, which for him was quite a low bar. You could say he was extremely paranoid at one point. He even cancelled all Red Cross flights to Nigeria uh, during the Nigerian Civil War because he was paranoid that the Red Cross would try to overthrow his regime. And he sent his daughter to go live in North Korea and he ordered massacres in Santa suits. He collected skulls and believed he was a sorcerer. Uh, he called himself the god at one point. He was extremely eccentric. He implemented completely unusual policies like banning the use of Western medicine, declaring certain professions illegal. He began renaming months and days after himself and family members. So his regime was really marked by paranoia and a cult of personality as well as systematic persecution. Gamer's terror was far-reaching and all-encompassing across the state. And then Equatorial Guinea would see constant constitutional changes, open societal repression, and the country devolving into a one-party state headed by a leader declaring himself ruler for life. With the political repression becoming so open that Ngema would order the execution of 150 of his political opponents on Christmas Eve 1975 by a group of soldiers all dressed as Santa Claus. The entire country existed in a semi-farcical state. What's far more depressing, though, is the fact that by the end of his reign, over a third of the entire country's population would either be dead or in exile overseas. And many argue that it still has not recovered even to this day. But his reign would mercifully come to an end in 1979 with a coup carried out by his nephew, the country's current president, Teodoro Obiang Ngema Obasco, better known simply as Obiang. So you take us through the coup and Obiang's ascension to power. Uh, so Francisco was deposed from power through a military coup led by his nephew, Teodoro Obiang. The coup was planned and executed by an, a group of military officers who were extremely dissatisfied with Ngema and also generally the policies. They saw the need for change and they had a desire to end the suffering and the complete instability caused by this extremely powerful and oppressive rule. On the day of the coup, the plotters seized control of strategic locations in the capital, uh, Malabo, which is on the island of Bioko, and other key areas of the country. He was captured and subsequently put on trial for his crimes, including genocide, mass murder, and embezzlement. It was generally received by the international community well and welcomed because of the rule had brought such immense suffering and instability. In so at this point, it's 1979, Ngema is out, and Obiang is in. But how would Obiang compare to Ngema now that he's in control of the country? So he is one of Africa's longest-serving leaders, having maintained his position for over four decades. His rule has been highly controversial and criticised for its corruption, human rights abuses, authoritarianism. Much of the population continues to face poverty, has limited access to basic services. The regime has been accused of embezzlement, nepotism, repression as well of political opponents. Um, internationally, he's often associated with autocracy and a lack of democratic governance. It has had this continued authoritarianism under his leadership. Obiang's rule has been more subtle and calculated in its approach compared to his uncle. While there may be some nuanced differences, and I think definitely, you know, when it goes back to the paranoia and the eccentric tone of his uncle, it does differ a bit. But between the two leaders, the overall trajectory of the country's governance under both of them have maintained these elements of authoritarian rule, which were established by his uncle. So Obiang's now been at the helm of Equatorial Guinea since 1979. 
nearly 44 years ago. So how has he managed to maintain this position for so long? The current government has had 12 coup attempts. Um, In particular, 04 is the one that's extremely well known. Uh, To understand why he has survived all of these, it really takes a closer look at the media in particular. Uh, It's completely controlled by the government. There's no independent media outlets. The population is consistently targeted with propaganda, disinformation. When it comes to security, his circle is extremely tight. Everyone in a room with him is someone he trusts and he vets them extremely. Everyone in his, um, when it comes to his personal security as well, this is where all the money goes. So this is, this is a rich country and all that money goes into his security detail. It does not go to the military, it goes to his personal security detail because he essentially doesn't want the military getting too strong because it could overthrow him. Although almost all of this came to an end in 2004, as a major coup was put into place to overthrow Obiang, with the coup being carried out by a South African mercenary and funded by powerful British political operatives. So can you take us through the 04 coup and how it all unfolded? In 2004, there was a major coup attempt aimed at overthrowing Obiang. Um, The coup was plotted and led by a man called Simon Mann. He was a former army officer and a mercenary involved in individuals with connections to the international arms trade. They planned to seize control of key locations in the country, including the capital, um, and remove him from power. The plot was intercepted and foiled. And several of the other participants, they were all arrested in Zimbabwe while attempting to acquire weapons. Subsequently, they were then extradited back to Equatorial Guinea and faced trial. They were convicted of crimes, including conspiracy to overthrow the government, possession of weapons, and violating the country's immigration laws as well. He was sentenced to 34 years in prison. However, this is where it changes. So in 2009, after serving a portion of his sentence, he was granted a presidential pardon on humanitarian grounds. He was released from prison and allowed to return to the United Kingdom. Many people think it was more of a diplomatic consideration that his release could have been influenced by diplomatic or political considerations that Equatorial Guinea wanted to build out. So there were others also convicted as part of this coup attempt, one of those people being a man named Mark Thatcher. And yes, it is that Thatcher, as Mark is the son of controversial former UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who was convicted as one of the main backers of the 04 coup. So can you take us through Mark's role in this attempted coup in Equatorial Guinea? Mark Thatcher, so he's the son of former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. He was essentially indirectly implicated in the coup attempt. So while he himself, he was not directly involved in the plot, evidence did emerge that he may have provided the financial support and logistical assistance to it. He was subsequently arrested in South Africa for violating anti-mercenary laws. He pleaded guilty on charges for aiding the coup plot. Uh, Thatcher received a suspended sentence, a fine, which is essentially like a community service as well that he currently resides in Monaco and continues to hold all of his British titles. After the failed coup in 2004, things really began to entrench in Equatorial Guinea, and the Obiang government fell even further into old ways. At the same time, many of the outside nations simply moved to just accepting the status quo, with USAID beginning funding in 2006, Equatorial Guinea joining OPEC in 2017, and US PMC companies began to train some of the police forces within the country. So with things seemingly solidifying within Equatorial Guinea, what path do you see laid out in front of Malabo, the capital of Equatorial Guinea, going forward? So the outlook for the country is really not promising. It's likely that they're going to face more isolation from the world if they continue. The country is not reforming. Promises made are not being materialized. Or for example, even moving the capital and building infrastructure in the mainland because most of the infrastructure is on Bioko. It's likely that they're going to continue to feel the isolation from the world. And if his son, which is, seems to be the most likely contender for succession. Uh, it's likely if he continues to become president, then there is going to be further corruption, further embezzlement, further the money laundering. It seems like there is really no path forward. And for the country, they're going from a bad president to likely even a worse president. Equatorial Guinea is a country so unbalanced that I've seen multiple macroeconomics textbooks go out of their way to make sure they include caveats that Equatorial Guinea should be seen as the exception to most rules when it comes to measuring things like human development, GDP growth, and economic prosperity. At its peak, Equatorial Guinea had a GDP per capita of 21517 That's higher than Spain, higher than Greece, and higher than most of Italy. And yet, it's in the middle of Central Africa, 
but with your revenues beginning to drop, that figure has already fallen to under half, settling at just under 10,000 USD per capita, roughly equivalent to a country like Mexico, Turkey, or Serbia. The stat that hasn't changed very much though, is the poverty levels in the country. The situation being that whilst the country earns roughly 10,000 USD per capita, 70% of the country live on less than $1 a day, which should give you an idea about the massive levels of inequality here in Equatorial Guinea. But what has this done to the country? And how do we arrive at this situation? Well, to answer that, we turn to our second guest. Part two, all for me and none for thee. It's largely based on all the wealth that comes to the country ending up in the hands of the president and a small family around him. But it's a bit lower now than it was four or five years ago. But at one point when I first looked at this, Equatorial Guinea had a per capita income, an average income, broadly the same as Poland or Spain, which is crazy when you think about it. So it was a high income country because the world is classified into high income, middle income and low income countries. So it was a high income country, so it doesn't qualify for any support from people like the World Bank or agencies like Oxfam would never look at it. But in reality, they had all of the money going to a small group of people. A large proportion of the population are desperately poor and just as poor, in fact, as Malawi or Tanzania or, you know, some of the other countries in West Africa like Niger. So you have the same infant mortality rate in Equatorial Guinea as it is in Burundi or even in Haiti. So desperately, desperately poor countries. And that's all because of inequality. You know, they have the money so that if it was given out evenly, everyone in Equatorial Guinea would be about the same as the average Spanish person. But clearly that's not the case. And most people are really living at levels of destitution more familiar with other countries in Africa. Max Lawson is the head of inequality policy for Oxfam International. He was also previously the head of policy and campaigns at Oxfam Great Britain and was one of the lead authors on some of Oxfam's most high-profile and prestigious papers and policies. He's also worked as an Oxfam governance advisor for over 25 years, helping to shape and provide assistance in national governments and public spending policies for numerous national and state governments, with a specialization in sub-Saharan African states. Max is one of the world's foremost experts when it comes to inequality and African governance and spending, and we're thrilled to have him back on the program today. The aid industry doesn't look at countries like Equatorial Guinea, as a whole, so not just Oxfam, but all donors and particularly the big multilateral agencies that make these lists of countries, notably the World Bank, is because they're completely blind to inequality. So as soon as the average income ticks over a certain level, then they get taken off a list and it's fairly blunt and very automatic. So if you move from low income to middle income, for instance, or from middle income to high income, then you lose access to the kind of aid and support that you used to get. And it can happen almost overnight. And donors tend to operate in more of a herd mentality. So if a country tips over into middle income, then suddenly the donors will say, oh, they'll follow the World Bank and say, oh, we're focusing on the poorest countries. You know, I saw this happen in Ghana, for instance. So in Ghana, which is a relatively well-run country, got major financial problems at the moment but you know historically not too bad a democracy and they tipped over into middle income and all the donors started to leave and it's not as if the people at the bottom the population the poorest people in Ghana suddenly became rich they just the average for the country meant that they tipped over this limit so Equatorial Guinea has been over that level for a long time so it would never even figure on the lists if you like of, of people like Oxfam and others because they would focus on the poorest countries not the poorest people and that's broadly the problem. The country was poor back in the 60s, 70s and 80s, but in 1995, Equatorial Guinea discovered huge deposits of oil just offshore. And in less than a year, foreign companies, mostly Americans, had started moving in to extract the oil. And very quickly, Equatorial Guinea became the state with the fastest growing GDP per capita of any nation in the world. And a lot of people predicted that Equatorial Guinea might become one of the economic powerhouses of sub-Saharan Africa. But in reality, how much of that oil actually flowed back toward the general public? It is something that we see is quite common, not just in Africa, but in lots of parts of the world, that when you see a massive influx of money for natural resources, not just oil, but gas, but also things like diamonds, that it's a huge incentive for corruption. But I would 
always stress when we talk about corruption that it takes bribe givers and bribe takers. So there are always people in elites in these countries who are willing to take bribes and to facilitate access to these mineral resources for a bribe. Also, increasingly from the US and others who are willing to pay those bribes as well to secure those resources for themselves. So there's a real kind of ballet of corruption that goes on when things are discovered. I always draw people's attention to countries in North Africa, like Algeria, Libya, where you do have uh, and have historically had quite significant revenues from oil, but they've never really gone above the kind of 10, 20, 30 percent of the economy mark. Although, you know, they do struggle with corruption and there's been at least a history of welfare provisioning for the for the people to some extent. Their levels of inequality are that high. I mean, their levels of political freedom are low, but their levels of inequality are not that high in North Africa. And that's a lot to do with the revenues from oil. Whereas you contrast that with kind of West Africa, and then you get oil revenues that become three, four times bigger than your entire economy, then obviously that's a real temptation, isn't it? And it's going to lead to problems of corruption, particularly if the companies involved don't really care and they're really just interested in getting the oil out. They're not really interested in the development of Equatorial Guinea or the futures of the poorest women and children. They just need to get those resources. When it comes to Equatorial Guinea, these Western companies extracting the oil offshore tend to claim that they have a level of plausible deniability, stating that they usually only work on the platforms that are far out to sea or out of the capital, Malabo with the capital being much nicer than the majority of the rest of the country and situated on the island of Bioko, 200 kilometers away from the mainland where most people live. But having worked in these sort of countries, how much do you believe that is an excuse? Are these foreign companies operating inside Equatorial Guinea unaware of the living conditions present within the mainland? They're well aware of what's going on. So why not raise the issue then? Often there's an element of foreign policy involved as well, particularly now with the competition for resources between the US and China. So it, we're returning to a situation that we had like back in the 60s and 70s with the Cold War, where famously with Mobutu, they, you know, like he may be a bastard, but he's our bastard, that kind of thinking, um, which then flows into turning a blind eye. And there are even more dichotomies than that, with the majority of Equatorial Guinea being so poor yet touting an incredibly high literacy rate, in fact, second in Africa, only behind the Seychelles. Yet the locals we spoke to for this piece stated that students often have to sit under the streetlights outside in the cold and wet in order to do their homework so they have light. So with this crumbling infrastructure, how are they managing such a high literacy rate? Literacy is about schooling, really. And if they've got reasonably good schooling, uh, you can get to to quite high levels of literacy. I mean, the the sad thing, but also the wonderful thing about uh, education, health, these kinds of things is you can achieve quite a significant amount with a very small amount of money. The population is also very small uh, compared to kind of some of these big countries like Nigeria and others that are trying to cope with literally 50, 60 million kids in school trying to get them to all read and write. Um, Equatorial Guinea is at least a reasonably small place. Equatorial Guinea relies on these oil exports for over 90% of its foreign earnings, and it is without a doubt the entire skeleton of their economy. So what would happen to the country if the oil ran out, or countries start to consider pulling out their investments from Equatorial Guinea? Does the state have a backup plan for when this happens? It's even worse than that, because I suspect that they would have borrowed on the strength of future revenue as well. So not only do you fall off a cliff when the resources run out, if you've borrowed on the strength of those resources, then you can end up not just having no more money coming in, but still having really significant debts from that period, which is a bit counterintuitive. But if you look at a country like Angola, it's really heavily indebted. That's because they've sold most of their future oil and gas revenue a discount in order to borrow money today. Uh, I suspect that's probably the case because there are plenty of people willing to lend money on the strength of those things. I always feel kind of sorry for them in a way because it's more likely than not that it will really hurt their politics, make them less democratic, and the majority of people will not benefit, which is crazy when you think about it because they've discovered something immensely valuable which could transform their economies. But sadly, the, the result was often the opposite. So the country was already a dangerous place, becoming a deeply authoritarian state. But the country was so small and out of the way that most of the world simply forgot about them. After all, they were the size of West Virginia whilst having a population smaller than North Macedonia, 
tucked away between Cameroon and Gabon on the mainland, and having the entire nation of Santome and Principe between their islands. But all that changed in 1995, with the discovery of massive deposits of offshore oil. And almost overnight, Equatorial Guinea became exceedingly wealthy, eventually attaining a higher GDP per capita than even its former colonial rulers in Spain. But how much of this wealth actually reached the people? What did it actually do for the country? Did Equatorial Guinea become the African version of Singapore, or did it become the African version of Turkmenistan? Well, to answer that, we turn to our second guest. Part 3. A Rusting Resource President Hobyong has been in power for 43 years now and has just been re-elected, if you can call it that, in November 2022 for a sixth presidential term. And this is the world record for longevity in power for living head of states. Despite its health, the country is also highly unequal. Around 70-75% of its 1.6 million inhabitants living below the poverty line. Florent Gilles is a senior conflict analyst and consultant specializing in Francophone Africa. Prior to his current role, he was the former Deputy Director of Operations and Director for Africa Office for the International Federation for Human Rights, and led numerous fact-finding and political contact missions to countries throughout the region, investigating everything from oil deals to military coups, and we're thrilled to have him on the program today. It was only fairly late in the 90s that offshore oil production began to develop in the Gulf of Guinea and Equatorial Guinea became a whole producing state. So at the time, oil resources seemed enormous for a small country like Equatorial Guinea. Uh, investments by the major oil majors were massive and Guinea gradually became the Africa's third largest oil producer and whole production still account for 90-95% of the country exports and resources today. So oil production in Equatorial Guinea is almost exclusively a deep water offshore. Until recently, ExxonMobil was the largest oil operator in the country. Basically, the profits are generally distributed as, uh, as follows. 70% for the major, 25% for the national oil company, the famous GP Petrol and 5% for the state. This is, for example, the deal signed in 2015 by ExxonMobil Corporation here, which contains the, the, the giant uh, Zafiro oil field. These massive oil deposits would be discovered in 1995, with the Mobile Oil Company beginning extraction in the country less than a year later in 1996, with Mobile merging to become ExxonMobil in 1999. Ever since then, the Zafiro offshore oil field has become the largest oil field operating in the country accounting for over 90% of Equatorial Guinea's exports. But as lucrative as it has been to the government in Malabo, things are beginning to change in the field. So can you take us through the changes we're currently seeing? The problem of uh, oil sector, two aspects. Firstly, the production from uh, fields opening in the 90s is more or less collapsing. The oil production will reach something like 98,000 barrels by day, compared with 162 barrels by day three years earlier, and 280,000 barrels per day in 2004. So that's to give you an idea. Uh, today, ExxonMobil intends to sell its asset into the Safiro uh, offshore oil field to a junior uh, enterprise who is specialized in the business uh, little known uh, to the general public, the exploitation of the hand of uh, life deposits. So this doesn't mean that the well are dry. Reserve that Zafira is still estimating at over a billion of uh, barrel. But the field is just no longer profitable in the eyes of the company that operates it. So ExxonMobil has uh, even announced that it will leave the country in 2026. And the second problem for the Guinea uh, is the lack of investment in the sector to make it more productive. However, for both oil and gas, the country is pinning its hopes uh, on the exploitation uh, of new fields. The deal that ExxonMobil has in place in Equatorial Guinea, the profits are split 70% to ExxonMobil, 20% to the state oil company run by the president's family, and just 5% going to the Equatorial Guinean state. Seems like a pretty bad deal for the country. So was Equatorial Guinea singled out to get this particularly rough deal from ExxonMobil, or are these sorts of splits quite common between oil companies in the countries in this area of the world? No, no, this is quite common. It has been the case since the whole boom in Africa in the late 70s, 80s, and the 90s. 
ExxonMobil had a similar policy in Nigeria, in Chad, for instance. Total, the French oil major did the same in, uh, in Congo, Gabon, and uh, elsewhere. So this kind of deal, it's quite common in Africa. Whilst simultaneously these oil deals seem to be breaking down, many within the ruling family seem to be turning to the question of succession, with Obiang now entering his 80s, with the two people vying for the position being Obiang's two sons. The first being Teodoro Ngema Obiang Mangu, not to be confused with his father, Teodoro Obiang Ngema Mbasgo. Now, because the names of the Ruli family are so similar, we'll make sure to keep things as simple as possible by using all the actors' preferred nicknames. So from here on in, the father will be referred to as Obiang, and the elder son referred to as Teodoro. Teodoro is currently the country's vice president and would be first in line, but he is also facing charges in Equatorial Guinea over stealing a plane for the national airline, as well as embezzlement and money laundering charges in the United States, United Kingdom, and France. On top of that, he's also a notorious Instagram star, constantly flexing his wealth and his luxury lifestyle all over the platform. Not a great look, where 70% of the country lives under the poverty line. The second son, Moto Obiang's second wife, a woman from San Tome and Principe, is named Gabrielle Mbaga Obiang Lima, but is more commonly known simply as Gabi. Gabi is currently Equatorial Guinea's finance minister, as well as the former minister for mines and hydrocarbons and has lots of control and lots of contacts within the oil and gas sector. Now, whilst Teodoro is flashy and well-known to the general public, and his posters are seen around the country, Gabi is nowhere near as flashy, but has much more experience and control over the country's levers of finance. And to complicate things more, we also have the president's brother, Armengo Ondo Ngema, who we'll refer to here as Armengo. Armengo was recently Equatorial Guinea's head of national security, before that department was brought in and Armengo was reassigned to be the head of the president's security detail. Now, being a man so tied to the national security apparatus and having a long-standing, somewhat tense relationship with the president, there's a lot of speculation that he feels slighted by this reassignment and also has his eyes on the crown as well. So it seems to be coming down between Teodoro, his oldest son, Gabi, his youngest son, and Armengo, his brother. But in your experience, who do you think is most likely to take the crown? On the one hand, you have the president, uh, Robyang, who a uh, clear desire is to propel herself, Theodorin, to the top of the state at all costs. This is why he's uh, vice president today. And to the other side are uh, two interesting persons, Amon Gaul and the general uh, Ba Gema, who are the president's uh, brothers, who are a dangerous guy. And the rest of the family split up uh, into those two uh, clans. Of course, Theodorin also tried to put away some of his brothers and the view. And you see how some of them have been put in jail or accused of corruption, etc. So the succession, it is likely to remain in the hand of the Obiang family in the future, probably. Well, if it is likely one of these three men to take over the country, what does that mean for the citizens of Equatorial Guinea? Are things about to get better or are they likely to get worse? From a political perspective, the president's succession is not very optimistic for sharing power and uh, for peaceful and democratic transition in Guinea. So, ExxonMobil may be walking out very soon, strolling right out that front door, more than content with the billions of dollars they already made extracting oil from the Equatorial Guinean coast. But what does that mean for the country? Whilst some of the country fret about the looming deadline, Others tout that countries like Russia or China or even France are on their way to save the day. Is there someone actually on their way to come help Equatorial Guinea to catch them before they hit the ground in 2026? Well, to answer that question, we turn to our final guest. Part 4. The End Times Equatorial Guinea is a very complex place full of contradiction, but that's on the cusp of some really important economic and political transition. Uh, Theodoro Obiang is Africa's longest serving president, having taken power from his uncle in a coup in 1979. Over the past nearly 50 years of rule, he has worked very diligently to consolidate power in his family, filling key positions in government with his sons, relatives, trusted friends. Um, now in his 80s, however, a conversation is starting to shift to succession, with many experts considering his son, Diodorin, as his likely successor. 
as a result of this consolidation of power in one family where you don't see a lot of checks and balances. I mean, on paper, all these institutions exist, a legislature, a judiciary, and executive, but really power is entirely consolidated in the executive. Um, Amelia Colombo is a senior associate at the CSIS Africa program and vice president of Voxcroft Analytics specializing in the analysis and comprehension of African state politics. Prior to this position, Amelia served as a senior analyst for the CIA, specializing in African and Latin American political and security issues. And we're thrilled to have her back on the program today. You have a country that, despite having this great economic wealth in theory, in reality, the majority of the population lives in poverty, lacks access to social services, to basic services. Even running water is not available to all. And at a time when the oil industry is changing and production is starting to decline in Equatorial Guinea. So you see this cornerstone of the economy starting to look a little crumbly around the edges. And perhaps the most complex and difficult aspect of Equatorial Guinea to navigate is its foreign relations. As a country that kind of borders on being a pariah state given its autocratic government's lack of respect for human rights, very obvious graft, uh, it casts a wide net uh, to find allies. And as a result, it has this cast of characters in its life that aren't always in lockstep with each other, that have the potential for competing interests in Equatorial Guinea and in the region more broadly. Well, the first relationship I want to take a look at is the one between Equatorial Guinea and the United States, as it's U.S. companies that do the majority of drilling within Equatorial Guinea. USAID money comes into the country, and the U.S. does provide some military training, mostly carried out by U.S. PMCs. But how would you categorize the relationship between Malabo and Washington? And is it one that's likely to change once Exxon leaves? As you noted, Equatorial Guinea is a recipient of aid. The U.S. has worked with Equatorial Guinea on these issues of maritime security, combating piracy in the Gulf of Guinea. You do see Equatorial Guinea participating in regional military exercises and included in a lot of these maritime security fora. But certainly the private sector plays an important role too. When we talk about the discovery of oil in um, the mid-1990s, 1996 or so, uh, U.S. oil majors were the first to get in on that and have played a key role in developing the oil industry, which, as I mentioned previously, has been the cornerstone of this country's economy. Is there a lot of military coordination between this area of the world? And if so, which countries does Equatorial Guinea usually like to coordinate with? Equatorial Guinea has participated in these regional exercises, which includes a wide range of partners from the United States, European states, other African states. I know Brazil has been involved in some maritime security activity as well in the region. So we do see some participation in these activities. Uh, the question then is the follow through. What comes after? As a society that is pretty closed, a government that um, has pretty free reign to choose policies and partners, sometimes the second steps are what is missing. Um, maritime security in general, which is what Equatorial Guinea often gets pulled into in the Gulf of Guinea with these other partners, is a hard topic to make relevant to governments, especially autocratic governments, who are potentially more focused on securing their own security, who are more focused on land forces and keeping sort of the presidential palace safe and sound. Things that are happening off the coast that they can't really see, that don't directly impact this narrow focus of national security. It's a little harder to motivate investing into. And uh, they are the types of things that require pretty significant investment as well. I would add to that as well that Equatorial Guinea is very much on paper a participant in a lot of different regional organizations, agreements, structures. But again, even in those cases, follow through has been a bit of a problem. I would say they participate, but kind of on a superficial level. Lula a few years ago actually traveled and visited Equatorial Guinea, and during his visit they did a big song and dance between the two leaders, and on the press run, Obiang announced that he would be buying Brazilian naval vessels for the Equatorial Guinean Navy. Yep, years later, nothing happened. So what happened, and why go through all of that press run and fanfare to do, well, nothing with it? 
there are a few factors to consider. I think one, we'd need to look at why Equatorial Guinea signs on to these things in the first place. Uh, as I mentioned, this country has a lot of the traits that would allow one to label it as a pariah state. Abuses of human rights, closed sort of society, autocratic government, it can be a little difficult to deal with. But at the same time, the country does care to some degree about its international reputation. As reliability of oil revenue starts to wane and the country has to make a little bit more effort in building relationships to perhaps sustain its economy, to diversify its economy, that international reputation may gain greater priority. So one way to make yourself look a little better is to participate to look like you're engaging to host AU functions, um, join these different organizations to reduce a little bit of the isolation that you are perhaps at risk of falling into. So to the extent that these outreach efforts, this participation is more of a PR exercise than perhaps the incentive to make some of the changes that might be required is quite low. And I think that's sort of the other side of the coin. To what extent is Equatorial Guinea willing to make some changes domestically and how in governance, in human rights, in investment in the population writ large rather than just in the ruling family, and to make those deeper changes that would allow it to then more fully participate in some of these activities. For example, you know, you mentioned the naval assets. So let's say that that happened. They still require significant investment in terms of maintenance and training people to use it, to use these assets. That's an investment that perhaps the government is unwilling to make. Perhaps the government looking at its political stability and what's required to stay in power judges that those resources are best deployed elsewhere. Well, let's talk about another international partner of Equatorial Guineas, this one being their former colonial masters in Spain. What is the relationship like these days between Equatorial Guinea and Spain? It's a relationship that has definitely waxed and waned over the years. Spain, along with some other Western countries, the US, a few Europeans, even South Africa, have in recent years started cracking down a little bit on this uh, really over-the-top graft in Equatorial Guinea, specifically targeting Obiang's son slash vice president slash minister of defense and potential successor, Theodorine um, Obiang for his uh, pretty lavish lifestyle. So Spain's role in some of that has become an irritant. Perceptions among officials in Equatorial Guinea that Spain potentially had foreknowledge of a coup plot in 2004 contributed to a downturn in relations and the ongoing presence of dissidents in Spain is also a bit of a bilateral irritant. So it's not the smoothest relationship and one that is definitely prone to downturns as a result of these sort of political and financial questions. Well, what about France and Equatorial Guinea? As that relationship seems to be increasingly complicated. As on one hand, France just raided one of Theodore's properties in France, seizing over 100 million euros worth of assets from the property. But on the other, the French government has offered military assistance to the country, and Equatorial Guinea uses the Paris-managed currency, the Central African franc, which we did a much deeper dive into a few episodes back. So with all this in mind, how would you sum up the relationship between France and Equatorial Guinea? That's another one that is not great, despite the participation of Equatorial Guinea in the CFA area. Uh, France is one of those countries that has cracked down on the excesses. And the vice president has been in a protracted legal dispute in France over some of the assets that the French claim are ill-gotten gains in France, uh, you know, homes and yachts and the like, which the Equatorial Ghanaian government has been arguing are government assets, part of like its embassy's stuff. The Equatorial Guinea lost that argument and these assets have been seized. Theodorine has been convicted in absentia, but I think his jail sentence was suspended, so he doesn't necessarily need to report to prison, but some hefty fines were imposed on him and whatnot. And that did not go over well. The Equatorial Guinea threatened to shut down its embassy in Paris, although it hasn't to date. Uh, and we saw in 2021, some French soldiers stopped in Equatorial Guinea to refuel their helicopter and were arrested on the grounds that they hadn't cleared the their landing. So we see the relationship between the two countries quite prickly as a result of, again, this effort to 
at least nominally, crack down on some of the graft and corruption that characterizes the equatorial Ghanaian government and economy. And what about its neighbors a little bit closer to home? So Cameroon to its north and Gabon to its south. What is the relationship like between these countries and Equatorial Guinea? Equatorial Guinea has, of course, through its history, had disputes with its neighbors that seem to have been largely resolved. But again, I think the neighbors get a little frustrated with the lack of commitment to regional efforts, regional organizations. Equatorial Guinea signs a lot of papers. They're on a lot of rosters, but they don't always put in the work. Like you don't see troops from Equatorial Guinea participating in ECOWAS deployments in any significant way, if at all. They hosted the AU summit, but then didn't really go beyond that. They've joined the um, community of Portuguese-speaking countries with the promise that they would abolish the death penalty, but still haven't really gone the distance in fulfilling that commitment. So I think that while relations are fine, there is this sense of frustration, I think is the best way to describe it, that Equatorial Guinea doesn't contribute more given its participation in so many regional and beyond organizations. Well, speaking of involvement with lots of international organizations, what about China? What is the role of China here in Equatorial Guinea? Do you think there's any truth to the rumors that China is about to buy up ExxonMobil's contracts or build the Djibouti of the Atlantic Ocean here in Equatorial Guinea? Or is that just one of those rumors that pops up every decade or so? Uh, You know, China's relationship with Equatorial Guinea goes back some 50 years now. So the relationship goes beyond what we've seen in terms of China's more recent African activity and strategy. But that being said, the types of investments that it has made in Equatorial Guinea are very much in line with its broader Africa strategy, with a very heavy investment in infrastructure and in telecommunications as well. One of the activities I think has really caught people's attention is China's investment in the port of Bata, a deep sea port that's attached to one of the most populous cities in the country. And that has certainly contributed to speculation that China may want to build a a naval base in that area. Um, More broadly, China's military and security engagement in the region has been growing since probably about 2014. Um, We saw Chinese naval vessels starting to pay ports of call in the Gulf of Guinea. We saw China get a little more involved in providing anti-piracy training. In Equatorial Guinea specifically, China's constructed naval barracks, military housing, Chinese military provided COVID supplies during the pandemic. So we see China quite engaged over the long run but certainly in recent times in ways that are very much in line with its broader approach to Africa. I think the future of the relationship will depend on a few things. First of all, the political transition that will almost certainly come within the next 10 to 20 years. Um, Analysts generally assess that the vice president, Theodine, is the most likely to succeed him as president. Now, this is someone, as we've discussed, who does not have a very good relationship with the West. And as he comes into power, potentially, if he were to come into power, assuming a smooth transition in government, I think we have to look at what that relationship with the West would look like and to what extent does a potentially negative relationship with the West open up opportunities for other partners to maybe fill in a void or provide an incentive even for Theodorine to want to build relationships with not just with China, but even with Gulf states and others to send a message to the West about his view of that relationship and how they've interacted through the years. I think there is an opportunity for China to potentially increase its involvement, but I think we also need to look at what China's priorities are in the continent, to what extent those are evolving, to what extent the resource allocation for things is changing, and to what extent China may still want, or what kind of relationship it may want with Equatorial Guinea. But I think, again, opportunity for China's increased engagement for the sort of outlook that a lot of analysts are concerned about in terms of becoming the West Coast Djibouti or perhaps still a few years out and may hinge to some extent or to a great extent on how this political transition plays out. The Equatorial Guinean economy is one of the most unequal anywhere in the world and is set up in such a precarious way that when Exxon does inevitably pull out of the country, the entire structure risks collapse. Something that stands in direct contrast to the US's hopes to increase stability throughout the region. Now, I know it's likely a dumb question, 
but what could the US government have done to lean on ExxonMobil to either offer Equatorial Guinea a better deal so they have more money to go around, or even push Malabo to make sure that more money ends up in the pockets of the citizenship rather than just the Obayang family? What sort of power does the US government have here for a US oil company operating within foreign waters? I question to what extent its influence is even that great. ExxonMobil is a, a business. It's there to conduct business, to make money to produce oil to do its thing. And that's their priority, not to carry out U.S. diplomacy necessarily. And I think when you consider the state of Equatorial Guinea's oil industry, that influence is probably waning. In fact, there have been reports recently that ExxonMobil is not planning to renew its license when it comes up in 2026. The oil exploration areas in Equatorial Guinea are starting to be less productive. The oil industry, a lot of these oil companies are starting to rethink their priorities and we see a shift towards gas. In fact, that is one of the factors that reports have indicated might be weighing on Exxon's decision to not renew not only the lack of productivity, but sort of the shifting energy needs and demands worldwide towards gas and cleaner energy. So if all that is indeed the case, if Exxon is planning to leave, if oil production is not quite as profitable as it used to be, then again, the incentive to push diplomatic agendas to to have even the influence to maybe have an informal sort of conversation around some of these political issues it is likely waning as well. Well, with Exxon being such a large part of the Equatorial Guinean economy, what happens when they leave in 2026? With it being such a large part of the economy, are there worries that when Exxon leaves, the economy just buckles in overnight? That is a major concern. When I look out to the future of Equatorial Guinea, it's the political transition and its economic health that perhaps worries me the most. Now, Exxon is not going to renew this particular license in 2026, according to reports. That doesn't mean they won't potentially get involved in gas exploration, or perhaps they have other licenses that will carry on. Um, it may not signify the absolute collapse of the oil industry, but frankly, the oil industry has been on the wane probably, um, i say 2014 or so. I saw one report state that in May of this year, uh, Equatorial Guinea didn't even export for the month of May as these different reserves start drying up and um, new production does not come online. So I think we've seen the oil industry really on the downward trajectory. The economic outlook is quite worrisome. Even the African Development Bank predicted a 1.3% decline in GDP this year, followed by another decline of on the order of 6% for 2024. So the country is definitely looking at some economic hard times. Reports that it's trying to diversify its economy. I don't know that that effort has been super productive. I'm concerned. I am very concerned for the future of Equatorial Guinea. I mean, this is a country that's kind of been stuck in one mode for about 50 years with President Obiang in charge, oil, well, I guess oil more recently in, from 1996 onwards, so definitely less than 50 years, um, but becoming a cornerstone of the economy. And those are two things that are on the precipice of change. It's not clear to me that Obiang, the transition from President Obiang to his son, if we assume that he is indeed the chosen one, will be smooth. I think when you look at some of his activities, this ostentatious wealth, some crackdowns that he himself has ordered within the country, points to someone who is trying to showcase that he has power and influence, who is trying to keep potential rivals in check. Will he be able to continue that once he is in charge? Um, or are we going to see a spurt of potential political violence, a crackdown on human rights as he combats potential rivals? Even in a situation where he ascends to power fairly smoothly, let's say there is no real pushback or he handles it quite quickly, does he have the wherewithal to govern as his father has done? Does he have the wherewithal financially, just even like relationship-wise, his ability to build key relationships, to sustain key relationships, to sustain power as his father has done? There are some who argue he does not, that he does not have the same charisma, that all this ostentatious wealth has really damaged not only the country's reputation, but his personally, and may hinder his ability to govern as his father has done, introducing again the risk of political instability uh, to a country that's been relatively 
quiet to the extent that there have been attempts at coups and whatnot. The government has cracked down and carried on um, this particular family in charge with Obiang specifically as president. And then I think we have the economic question that, again, throws a bit of a spanner in the works. To what extent can the government bridge any sort of economic gaps during this transition from potentially oil to minerals and other sources of income? To what extent do these patronage networks start to crumble? And what does that then mean for political stability? What does that mean for the social contract? I think as we see changes politically, I wonder to what extent that then opens up a conversation about governance. To what extent would that embolden opposition parties, even those in exile and others dissatisfied with how things have gone in the country? To what extent does that empower or encourage them to try for some more effort or put more effort into trying to bring about change? So I think the country is facing a period of potential instability, depending on how these political questions get answered and these economic uncertainties get managed. Twenty twenty six is not that far away, and to Obiang, it must appear like the edge of a cliff as his truck races full speed towards it. Twenty twenty six is only nine hundred and six days away, and Obiang has a lot to do in those nine hundred and six days. During that period, he has to transition his son into power and give him time to steady his hands on the ropes, hopefully before they ride off the cliff, or whilst fending off challenges for the throne from his brother and younger child. He also has to somehow diversify the economy or a country which has had little to no economic investment put into it over the last few decades. And rather than taking the massive influx of temporary wealth and setting themselves up like Botswana or Norway, the leadership of Equatorial Guinea, instead in direct dereliction of their duties, blew it all on yachts, supercars and foreign mansions. And when the country does inevitably tumble off that economic cliff and the people of Equatorial Guinea come to the palace searching for what was rightfully theirs, They'll fortunately have thousands and thousands of Instagram posts right there in the president's feed as receipts for every dollar they're owed. Thank you so much for checking out the show this week. Equatorial Guinea was an absolute rabbit hole of a country to research, and there's not many people doing much research on it either. And we really toot and fro whether we'd actually pull this episode off. So hopefully, if you made it this far in the episode, you enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed putting it together. As you may have also seen, this was our 99th episode. So I'm glad to say that next week, we have something very special coming up for our 100th episode of The Red Line. And if you want to keep up to date when we unveil our 100th episode, you can find all of our links and info on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at The Red Line Pod. Or you can follow me on Twitter on the handle at MikeElliotOz. Oz is in Australia. This show is completely funded by our amazing Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each month to help us keep myself and the team going. And speaking of amazing Patreons, this week we'd like to thank Thomas Lipping, Lyle, Simon, and Leila Stewart, who are the latest Patreons to sign up as of time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of listeners like this, and we're incredibly grateful for all the support they give us here at the show. So if you like what we do here, and you can spare a couple of dollars each month, we would greatly appreciate the support. But for now, this episode on Equatorial Guinea is all thanks to you guys. As usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is Silence Resistance, Women, Dictatorships, and Gender Washing in Western Sahara and Equatorial Guinea by Joanna Allen for a fantastic look at how women have been at the forefront of the resistance movements in these countries. The second is The Scramble for African Oil by Douglas A. Yates for a look at how the oil industry muscled itself into the region. And the third is my favorite book covering the subject, The Looting Machine by Tom Burgess, for an insight into how the resource extraction industry works here in Africa. I want to say thanks to this week's guests, Perry Grace, Max Lawson, Florent Gill, and Amelia Colombo. All of you were absolutely fantastic to jump on the lineup this week and be so accommodating with our shifting schedule. I also want to give a thanks to my staff, starting with the primary researchers for this episode, Robbie Sutton and Ahmad Al-Ahmad. In addition to their work, I'd also like to thank Wade McCarr, the producer, Perry Grace, Daniela Zivella, Genevieve Donald May, Nate Ostella, Nick McNally, Sean Cotter-Lem, Isaac Gibbs, Ahmad Al-Ahmad, Andrew Garbery, Scott Missler Ferguson, and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Jamie Tannen, our media director, Raul Devana Rayanan, our OSIN analyst, Francis Leach, our director of breaking news, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Ross Crabtree, our media advisor, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, 
a Nick March Upfield correspondent. And I have a lot more to say about this fantastic group during our next episode. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with our 100th episode special. But until then, thank you for listening. A good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Red Line podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.